Reo, Ete Iti, Ete Rahi, Ena Matawaka Ona Topito Ota Ao, Piki Mai, Kaki Mai, Nao Mai, Haere Mai, Hitene Ona Wanaga, Fakatao Mai, Tenakoto Katoa. Uh, welcome, I'm the Dean of Faculty of Medical and Health Sciences, John Fraser, and it's my very great pleasure to welcome you all here today to this mini symposium entitled Regulation, the Responsible Control of Drugs. It is indeed a great honour to be given the opportunity to open this event, and has, which has been formally organised by the New Zealand Drug Foundation, and we have two keynote speakers from the Global Commission on Drug Policy, uh, one of whom uh, will be most familiar to everyone, former Prime Minister and, uh, of New Zealand, Right Honourable Helen Clark, and we also have Madam Ruth Dreyfus, former President of Switzerland and Chair of the Global Commission. This uh, symposium is being live streamed and I would like to offer a warm welcome to our online viewers, wherever you might be. Firstly, uh, the usual housekeeping comments. Please switch off mobile phones to silent. Photos are okay, but no flash. Uh, I would also ask that people save any questions they might have to the end of the presentations. We do have a strict time limit today, unfortunately. This is a university and there are students who are coming in here for a medical exam at one o'clock. Uh, and I'm sure we'll be vacated by then. Uh, in the event of a fire alarm, people should proceed in an orderly manner through the various signposted emergency exits, including the rear doors uh, from which you came in, and make your way to the outside of the building. Do not linger in the lobby. So, it goes without saying that drug dependency affects almost every aspect of New Zealand life. It is not only the illicit trade of recreational drugs that is causing harm to our society, but also the growing dependency to prescription medications leading to unexpected consequences. For example, the serious addiction crisis now embedded in Canada and the USA is arguably a consequence of the legal, legal overprescription of pain medication by well-meaning health practitioners. While we have thankfully been spared the serious consequences of opioid addiction in New Zealand, we are usually on the whip end of overseas trends and are now confronted with emerging problems of new synthetic drugs uh, the consequences of which we know little about. The policies and laws that we establish should always focus on the greater good to society and must always be bound on sound research, evidence and experience from other countries. Which says, segues very nicely into my introduction to uh, Professor Benedict Fisher. Uh, Benedict is our latest addition to the uh, faculty at the University of Auckland, so new in fact that he arrived two days ago. Uh, he has been recently appointed to the Hugh Green Foundation Chair in Addiction Research at the University of Auckland, and I'd like to take this opportunity to personally thank the Hugh Green Foundation for their generous support in establishing this very important chair at the University of Auckland. Professor Fisher arrives uh, at a very timely uh, point in New Zealand um, where the current government is considering the legalisation of cannabis. Uh, Benedict hails from Toronto, where he held a chair in addiction psychiatry at the University of Tor Toronto and was a senior scientist at the Centre for Addiction and Mental Health in Toronto. He has published numerous books and papers in the field of addiction research, but perhaps more importantly was actively involved in the research and advocacy that led to the recent legalisation of cannabis in Canada. I believe there is no better person in this country who can speak from direct experience. So with that, I would like to invite Professor Fisher to the podium uh, as an introduction uh, to give us a brief summary of experience and then to chair the session for our two keynote speakers. Benedict. Thank you very much, John, for these kinds of words of introduction and welcome. Kia ora. Uh, good day, bonjour, guten tag. I think we covered all the languages. It's a great pleasure to be here. It's a fantastic event uh, for me for two reasons. One of them is you will be having uh, two enormously important authoritative experts on global drug policy speaking to you in a second. It's a great day for me personally because as John said, this is uh, my new job, my new home. 
I almost literally stepped off the plane. You exaggerated, this is about 28 hours ago. <laughs> I still walk around with a map and I have a little note in my pocket that says, look right first when you cross the road. <laughs> Uh, and I don't do, always do that, but I'm still alive, so good news so far. Um, it, it's really great to be here for this event, and uh, I will immediately focus on the next 90 minutes and the content that we'll be sharing and discussing here on this very, very timely topic. I'll do a couple of things first before I hand it over to our distinguished speakers, and then we'll have a bit of an interactive uh, session and Q&A. Um, but um, before and uh, any more long ado remarks, I will introduce our uh, speakers here and uh, I'm extremely delighted to have them here with us and uh, to be hosting this event with you today. So the first speaker of the Global uh, uh, Commission on Drug Policy is Madame Ruth Dreyfus uh, from Switzerland. Uh, she's looking back at a long career in politics. She was a member of the City of Bern's Legislative Council uh, from 1989 to 1992. She was a member of the Federal Council of Switzerland, which is the equivalent of the Swiss government from 1993 to 2002. Uh, she served as a head of the Federal Department of the Interior or the Home uh, Office, responsible for public health, social insur insurance, science and higher education for numerous years. She was a vice president of the Swiss Federal Council in 1998 and elected the first female president of the Swiss Confederation in 1999. Madame Dreyfus initiated and oversaw many progressive initiatives in public health and addiction care. Most notably to me, actually, she initiated and oversaw the Swiss heroin prescription trials that began in Switzerland in the early 1990s, which provided medical, prescribed medical heroin to treatment refractory heroin addicts, which was a seminally innovative and at the time very controversial treatment, which has spawned similar trials, experiments, and now national programs in about a dozen uh, countries around the world, including uh, Canada following these innovative trials in Switzerland almost uh, 25 years ago. Um, uh, Madame Dreyfus is the current chair of the Global Commission on Drug Policy, so it's fantastic to have her here with us. Uh, the same, of course, goes for Madame Helen Clark uh, that I'd like to welcome and introduce briefly. Uh, and she's probably very well known to all of you, of course, as a former prime minister uh, of, of New Zealand. Uh, also, looking back at a long and successful career in politics, uh, she held different cabinet posts in the New Zealand government starting in the late uh, 1980s, was the first elected female prime minister of New Zealand, serving three terms from 99 to 2008. I read that she championed uh, many essential causes of health advancement and social justice in this country, including uh, sexual health, HIV prevention care, gender minority rights, violence against women, and uh, there's a further long list of causes she's effectively championed. Uh, but she's also been catalyzing and um, uh, progressive thinking and social debate around drug and addiction related issues, including, I think, courageously thinking aloud about cannabis decriminalization as early as the 1990s, and uh, under her reign as prime minister, the Law Commission review of, misuse of the Misuse of Drug uh, Act was actually initiated. Uh, Madam Clark has been a commissioner with the Global Co uh, Commission on Drug Policy since uh, 2017. So the commission and all the important seminal work it's been doing on health-oriented drug reform could be no better represented than with our two distinguished uh, guests here today. So welcome again to you from me as well. Um, very briefly, our guests will be speaking on the Global Commission on Drug Policy's new report on responsible regulation, and I will not uh, even delve into any of the content of that report. However, this report is extremely timely and important for informed drug policy uh, report discussions at this very point in time. 
for several reasons in that it first of all uh, opens and uh, very aptly describes the collateral harms of prohibition as they relate to both adverse health consequences and uh, collateral social harms including violence and crime that are affecting our societies and communities everywhere. It makes the point very clearly again that we, in order to reduce those harms on population and community levels, we radically need to rethink and revise both our international drug control frameworks and our national drug policies to achieve those goals. Decriminalization is not enough, is I think a literal if not uh, apt uh, quote from that report in that decriminalizing use does not address the underlying dynamics and factors that are actually driving those collateral unintended harms of misguided prohibitionist drug policy. Specifically, it makes the key point uh, that regulation of psychoactive substances must be an essential component of health-oriented drug policies, otherwise they will hit a wall and uh, will only have very limited effects in the objectives that um, health-oriented drug policy reform actually pursues and seeks to achieve. We need to think about regulation of psychoactive drugs in order to protect the health of drug users and our communities. So it takes that issue, that challenge right on in a very informed and evidence-based way and I'll let our guests elaborate more on the content and rationale of that particular report. I will just uh, close my introductory remarks with a couple of comments and segues from the Canadian situation which really um, link perfectly or set up perfectly the particular cause that the commissioners are championing here in that, as John Fraser kindly mentioned already, uh, I've been working on two seminal issues pretty much over the last 10 years in Canada, where, by the way, we don't have a female prime minister, but we have a declared feminist as a, as a prime minister <laughs> with a very famous name in addition to that. Um, we've been facing two very different issues in, in Canada over the last two years. One of them is, as was mentioned um, a week ago, we launched uh, the first national le legalization of non-medical cannabis policy in the G7 world. This is a major social and health experiment, if you will, in Canada, and we will monitor this very closely over the next two years, what the impacts of that will be. The main rationale, one of the main rationales uh, for cannabis legalization in Canada has been the objective to improve public health and safety. And policymakers a number of years ago realized that, again, decriminalization is not enough. One of the main cornerstones for improving public health and safety is that you need to supply a regulated, as safe as possible product to users, especially if such high consumption rates exist as for cannabis in, in Canada in order to improve public health and safety. This is part of the rationale for uh, legalization of non-medical cannabis use and supply in Canada to improve public health and safety, not to just liberalize it as a free-for-all for everyone but to improve public health and safety with a regulated and, and, and uh, organized and strictly controlled product supply. That's kind of the good news story from Canada. The bad news story from Canada is the opioid crisis that has been raging now for almost 15 years. I've closely worked on that topic since it began. It's a very, very sad story. Last year we had about 4,000 overdose deaths uh, the numbers seem to be rising still. We may be looking at more deaths, opioid-related deaths, even this year. And part of the issue has been, despite the fact that over the last 15, 20 years, there's been many expansions and implementation of health-oriented drug intervention, more treatments, safe consumption sites, needle exchange, naloxone provision pretty much everywhere you go. The one issue that has not been addressed is the challenge of toxic drug supply. Canadians, just like in the United States, by the thousands are dying 
because our prescription opioid um, diversion fed drug markets that have brought a lot of people into the misuse of opioids have now been replaced with illicit clandestine opioid products, fentanyl, car fentanyls, that are highly toxic, uh, that are extremely potent, that are ubiquitous in, in availability. This is what's killing people. Our governments have done a lot of things, our policymakers have done a lot of things, but what they have not been effectively addressing is, a, is tackling or even understanding how to best tackle that challenge of the toxic drug supply that is killing people. That's a main challenge for addiction, drug misuse, and public health at the moment in my country, in my former country, I should say, in many other countries, and uh, to some extent, and hopefully not to an increasing uh, extent in New Zealand as well, we have to tackle and think about that issue in an evidence-based, measured, but very active and courageous way. So these are very seminal, critical uh, linkage points to the situation in Canada. I will now not take more time away from our commissioners and the many enlightened and important things they'll have to say about uh, the new Global Commission on Drug Policy report. It's my pleasure to welcome you and turn the microphone over to you. Thank you very much for your time. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great pleasure to be, to be here and to address such an interesting and interested audience. Um, let me try to make some clarification about what we will be speaking together during uh, the time of this conference. And building on our experience, Helen and mine, and the experience of the members of the Commission, the journey we did together until the year, uh, from the year uh, 2011 when we began to work together, we learned a lot of things. And we learned the need also to clarify exactly about what we are speaking. And this uh, report, I think it's the seventh report, or well, if I am right, is uh, the result also, I mean, the different reports of this journey. But let, let me begin by my experience, and I think it's also, also Helen's experience, and it's also val valuable for the situation here. First of all, we had to see that after many, many years where drug issue was not a big issue, was not a concern of the population, was not something that was really in the awareness of the people. The idea that uh, you might just prohibit the substances and try to bring people who are dependent to abstinence through different type of treatment was accepted broadly. Internationally, it's the basis of the uh, three international convention. So I mean, it's not really, it was not really an issue. It was an issue in some countries where some minorities were considered to have a problematic use, and this problematic use of special substances was used to criminalize and to uh, stigmatize this group of population. Latino American using uh, cannabis, uh, marijuana, Chinese worker using opium, the rebels against the war uh, in Vietnam using LSD. But a part of that, there was a large consensus that, yes, why not? We might reduce supply, we might reduce consumption, we might fight against organ a criminal organization all together under these three uh, international conventions. But in the 80s, the things changed radically. They changed because it was clear at this, from this moment on, uh, on it was clear that uh, drug-free society was an illusion and that the prohibition was a way also to uh, not to tackle with the, with the problem, but to increase the problem. 
It was also a way not to know about the problem because the scientific evidence were lacking. The information of the public was very uh, far from the, from the reality. And the consequences of that, when the, I think about our experience when the epidemic of AIDS came into our countries and when it was fueled by uh, injecting drug communities, but also with other communities at the forefront of the epidemic, like the men having sex with men and, uh, and, uh, and the sex workers, we had to find pragmatic solution. We were not in a position to have really a systematic uh, analysis about what was wrong in the whole system. We just had to tackle what was, was wrong to answer to the difficulties that uh, the policy had on the life of the people. And this was a first approach. I call it generally the public health approach. It was to change really uh, the view we had on the drug issue saying, and that was an exaggeration, I think, that it is mainly a health problem. I think when I say that it was an exaggeration, it is because it let in the shadow the fact that many people are consuming drugs without having health problems. That the majority of the people are able to control their consumption of drugs as they are also able, as a majority, to control the consumption of alcohol. But that some people had very difficult uh, relationship with their drug, on one side because they became dependent, but on the other side because without becoming dependent, they were consuming in a way that they put it at the highest risk. So the first pragmatic answer was just harm reduction. Look that the people uh, who are consuming are able to do it in a less harmful way. That was syringe exchange. That was in Switzerland, safe consumption room, drug testing, all these measures to allow the people to take a better responsibility of what they are doing when they are consuming drugs. And in the meantime, we saw that many people are looking for treatment, but didn't receive the treatment that was really the treatment they needed. They were pushed, for instance, in abstinence-oriented treatment. For some of them, it was what they wanted. And they could perhaps do it, but they could also relapse and, and re-begin. And we said at that time, as many times somebody is relax uh, relapsing and making a new tentative, it, this person is progressing, but other people needed other kind of treatment, psychosocial treatment, but also substitution treatment, methadone, and as it was said by the, uh, Benedict, heroin treatment, why not? Heroin is not as such a poison. It can be a medicine for chronic disease, and if it is uh, uh, prescribed in a, in a very well-controlled situation, it is the answer that allows many people to recover a balanced life. So, secondly, treatment, enlarging the spectrum of treatment was the second answer from the public health perspective. And the third answer, and this is quite a discovery that is recent, is that uh, we have to find a way that people can really um, come into access of controlled medicine that are in the large majority of the countries of the world not accessible because they are in the meantime considered as drug and as medicine and the control is so strong that uh, the people uh, cannot receive, for instance, morphine for a pain uh, killer and uh, suffer uh, sufferance that uh, would be uh, avoidable. So this is the public health approach, and most of them was in an emergency situation. But it was very clear very soon that criminalizing the people was building obstacle to their access of these services, that criminalizing the people was just the thing 
that we shouldn't do because doing it, it was also making the circle between uh, false uh, misunderstanding about what drugs are, uh, pre prejudice against the people, um, false perception, stigmatization, and so on, was the uh, circle that we had to, uh, to break in order to bring people uh, really to, uh, uh, as I said before, less harmful and controlled uh, consumption. And this was really, uh, is also uh, ongoing in many countries, the idea that criminalizing people who in the worst of the case are harming for themselves but not are harming other people shouldn't be criminalized. And that the incredible explosion of the incarceration rate in the last 30 years in the world has a lot to do with the drug policy, the punishing uh, repressive drug policy under the flag of prohibition. But all that is just uh, the way to react again a situation that is a situation of emergency. The, uh, the cornerstone of the whole policy is prohibition and remains prohibition. So decriminalization is, a, is an an uh, answer, but it is not the logical answer because it doesn't in, um, be enough uh, aware about the existence and the uh, empowerment often of the criminal uh, supply of the drugs. So that uh, our last report we presented uh, uh, last month in Mexico uh, with Helen Clark also, is really on regulation. So let me just say two words about what is regulation. Regulation is putting for each harmful or potentially harmful substance or conduct a set of rules, a set of rules that allows under the control of the state that this harmful substance or this harmful conduct is not destroying the life and the integ social integration of the people. And we have experience about that. I mean, the whole medicine control system is a regulated system. The food system is regulated against fake uh, foods and uh, hygienic uh, rules. Um, I remember that when I was minister, I had to discuss which kind of product can be used for joys, uh, de jouets, spielzeug, toys. Huh? Toys. for toys, because toys can also be uh, a threat for the children playing with these toys. So I mean, we are, we know a lot of things about regulation, setting the rules and controlling through the state that these rules will be respected. We, have, we are in a world where these rules can be too large or too restrictive. And we have to choose inside this spectrum what is adapted to the harm of this product and this conduct under the clear respect of the freedom of the people, the human rights of the people, and the responsibility of the people, but the overarching responsibility of the state that what they will find in the society is as less harmful as possible. This is what, uh, on, on what we are speaking in our report on regulation. It's not a liberalization. It's not uh, creating big uh, cannabis instead of big tobacco. It's not uh, giving uh, uh, the, the leaders of the economic world all freedom to put everything on the market. It is really the responsibility of the state to evaluate the harms and to react in consequence of the harms. So that uh, all what we did is still valid. Harm reduction is valid. Treatment uh, uh, we invented are valid. Decriminalization is something we should decide immediately and, and all over the world in my, in my view. But at the end of the day, what we need are regulated market. Thank you for your attention.
Good morning, everybody. And can I thank the Dean for hosting us in the medical school today, uh, Professor Fisher on his second day in New Zealand for, uh, for uh, welcoming us also. And can I acknowledge the former Dean, uh, Peter Gluckman, who has done so much to push evidence-based policy making uh, in our country. And I think uh, this is one of those areas which needs a good uh, dose of, of that. Uh, so, uh, my job is to talk a little bit about the report, and I may, uh, in the course of that, uh, allude to some of the uh, New Zealand context. We released this report in late September in Mexico City. Uh, on that occasion, one of our members, former President Zedillo of Mexico, who left office in 2000, uh, the day after we left, did a major speech at the equivalent of the Institute of International Affairs based around a report that he and a number of other uh, Mexican academics had pulled together on the cost of the, quote, war on drugs uh, for Mexico. And I think we're accustomed these days to seeing Mexico in the headlines for an absolutely horrific homicide rate before the full force of the war on drugs was unleashed in Mexico, it was not known for having an especially high homicide rate at all. And what they've been able to chart from the time of the, the Calderon uh, presidency, which uh, began in late 2006 through to uh, 2000, and then you know, looking at the trends through to 2017, is that the cost of the war on drugs has been over a quarter of a million deaths, a third of a million displaced people internally in Mexico who have fled from their communities, uh, and uh, 35,000 people who have disappeared, right? probably dead, probably can add them to the quarter million. Now, about six years ago when I first went to Bogota in Colombia, the then president, President Santos, said to me, we have paid such a heavy price for the war on drugs here, and they certainly did because the prohibitionist approach which drives the trade into the uh, illegal uh, market of traffickers, of course, was one of the sources of, of income which fueled the, the half-century-long insurgency. Uh, and they had uh, so many deaths and disappearances and uh, internal displacement uh, from that. So, you know, all our problems are relative, aren't they? We have our issues, but, you know, these countries, countries of production and transit, uh, have really faced incredible consequences uh, from the prohibitionist approach. And I suppose I don't have to underline uh, uh, the point uh, that the biggest market was north of the border in the country, which has, at the federal level, had one of the hardest lines on drugs. So that's one of the, uh, the paradoxes as, as well. So where the report comes down is, as uh, my colleague, the chair of the commission, I'm so delighted that the commission has come down to New Zealand to help with advocacy on, on this issue. Uh, the report comes down for saying that uh, currently prohibited drugs should be regulated, they should be decriminalised and regulated, that policy makers should seek evidence uh, on the legal regulation of drugs and open up you know, participatory processes for proper discussion uh, on this. It's also my view that in our country, which is a small country and therefore has a small public service and capacity, that we don't need to reinvent the wheel here. Yes, we have national conditions and context to adapt to, but there are now so many examples in like-minded countries that we can draw from and adapt from. We don't need to completely uh, reinvent the wheel uh, in this area. So, as Ruth uh, Dreyfus has, has underlined, uh, the state accepts a responsibility to regulate in all sorts of areas where a good may be uh, potentially uh, harmful. Uh, we regulate tobacco. You know, I was the first to step up to the major regulation of tobacco with the Smoke Free Environment Acts in 1990. And what an incredible success that act and all the subsequent amendments have been. You know, we face the prospect really of a smoke-free generation in our lifetimes. Uh, the prevalence of smoking now at 14 when the annual survey of adolescent smoking is, is done is, is very, very low. We didn't do it by prohibiting it. That would have had the effect that <laughs> prohibiting these other drugs has had of driving it into a black market and criminalization and so on. But we've done it through you know, regulation, 
uh, and good uh, public health uh, advocacy and social marketing. We regulate alcohol. Arguably, not enough. That happens to be my opinion. Not enough. Uh, we regulate road safety, we regulate firearms, we regulate all sorts of things. But drugs haven't been regulated in our country or most countries because we have these most unfortunate UN conventions, and normally we look to UN conventions to set a gold standard. These ones set the dunce standard because they uh, are prohibitionist uh, and you know, really uh, take a very moral judgment that drugs are evil, therefore people who use them are evil, and therefore the whole book should be thrown at them. And from there comes the, the criminalization uh, and going after uh, the users uh, uh, and, and, of course, the suppliers. And in the extreme cases, like the Mexicos and the Colombias, that can be a very heavily mil militarised response with all the uh, consequences of that. So uh, what our report says is that regulation deals with the reality of drug use and drug markets as they already exist. Yes, all drugs have risks, but where there is a legal supply, illegal supply, we increase uh, the risks. We believe that regulation can moderate them. And we say we must regulate not because drugs are safe, but because they are risky. That is the case uh, for uh, regulation. We say, obviously, different drugs will require different levels of regulation, depending on their risks. And regulation will vary from one place to the next. If we think of the Canadian uh, precedents at the moment, Canada is everyone here will know, has just legalised the use and possession and supply of cannabis. It has not done that for other drugs, but cannabis is its step to a regulatory approach. It happens to do a lot of other things around the other drugs with, with harm reduction, and obviously, as uh, Professor Fisher says, they haven't found the magic answer yet. Uh, you know, they're trying. And there is a strong school of thought in Canada, I understand, in both the Liberal Party and the New Democratic Party uh, 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 policies that they should decriminalise personal possession and use of the other drugs as well. But at this point, the government has not, uh, has not gone there. But, you know, it, it is a, a, a legitimate debate. So we think that regulation allows governments to take back control uh, of the market. Uh, to take back the control from criminals and to put in place a proper uh, regulatory regime. And how you regulate, as I say, will differ depending on the nature of the drug and it, it, its risks. I understand from the long conversations that Ruth and I have had that in Switzerland now you may uh, go to a local shop and you can buy uh, a form of cannabis with a very low level of THC, is it? Uh, but it's there. It's there for purchasing in the shop. It also has a quite high component of CBD. Uh, now, you know, one, one thinks for a moment, you know, the marginalised people in our country who are buying this incredibly dangerous so-called synthetic cannabis, if they could wander into the local store and buy what you can get in Switzerland, would they be putting their lives in danger with, a, with an illicit market? I suspect not. So in my view, actually, the debate we're about to have in New Zealand on the legalisation of cannabis could in itself be quite an important response to some of the issues uh, that we're seeing here. One of the responses, we need uh, quite a number. Now, as Ruth uh, said, and let me underline, we need to learn uh, the lessons uh, that we've, we've had to learn slowly and painfully uh, with the over-commercialisation of tobacco and alcohol. You know, those drugs came into our societies completely unregulated, and they got away on us uh, with the death toll from uh, tobacco and, of course, the, the many uh, consequences uh, of, uh, of um, uh, alcohol uh, consumption. Uh, so we, we need to have in our minds a frame that we don't want over-commercialisation. I think... Uh, there are many lessons from tobacco regulation for cannabis regulation, actually, and how you regulate for sale to minors, plain packaging, health risks, information, and, 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 and so on. Uh, you know, we, do, we do have some uh, experience in, uh, in these areas. Now, uh, some raise the question, 
you know, what will the impact of regulation be on organised uh, crime? Well, of course, organised crime is a, a factor in all societies, worse in some uh, than others. Uh, but the fact that they might turn to doing something else is not an answer for taking this off them, I think is the short answer, uh, because leaving uh, the supply of what are currently considered the illicit drugs in the hands of criminals is in itself a, a, a very, very uh, dangerous uh, thing to do. We need to take control of this market and we need to, uh, to regulate it. I understand actually that one of the fastest growing illegal markets in the world these days is the fake pharmaceuticals killing small children, babies in West Africa. You know, poor people go down to the market, babies sick. Uh, you can go to the, the proper pharmacy. Uh, the drug is this much, but down the road they're saying they've got one that's only costing this much, so you buy that. Well, at worst your baby may die, or may be very sick, or there may be Im no impact at all. This is a huge illicit trade now, and, and something that needs its it, 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 its own response too, of course. Now, one of the uh, issues we canvass in the report is, uh, what about the obstacle of the UN treaties? Well, they are an obstacle, uh, and they most definitely need amendment, and ideally replacement. But of course, there are rather painful constituencies, or rather, rather um, strong constituencies against that. And it, it's amazing what can bring very diverse member states together. So on this one, you have a lineup of the United States, Russia, China, and Iran, who are all very hard line on, on these, uh, these issues. But of course, uh, as we know in our own country, if the law is an ass, people ignore it, as they largely have with cannabis. So if the conventions are an ass, countries actually get on and do what they think is best for their, their people. And uh, Canada, with what it's done with legalization, is, we would describe, as being in respectful non-compliance with the conventions. They're not pretending to comply with the conventions, right? They don't accept the prohibitionist approach. They have, they have uh, uh, legalized. So ideally, uh, there should be a reform process, but this will take some time and some change of administration in some rather important countries, uh, one, uh, one suspects. Uh, and I must say, I'm full of admiration for our prime minister who, when confronted, uh, with the US President's uh, War on Drugs style declaration at the UN, which countries were strong armed to, to sign, she stood firm and said, no, that's not the way we want to approach the issue in New Zealand. And that leads me, uh, well, I'll come, come back to the New Zealand issue, issue, issue in a moment. But with the uh, drugs issue, uh, back in 2009, the UN member states agreed on a plan of action and Ruth, in effect, alluded to that in her opening comments. Uh, they wanted, in the decade from 2009 to 2019, to eliminate the illicit supply of drugs. <laughs> Failure, right? There's actually no official accountability for these results, of course. You can't get official accounts of <laughs> what happened. It's, it's too embarrassing. It's a total failure, <laughs> that decade on, on drugs. Uh, now, a little bit of light came in 2016 with the UN General Assembly special session on drugs. I was head of UNDP at the time, and to be as helpful as I could to the cause, UNDP produced a very good report on the impact of the current settings on uh, development, and uh, the Global Commission has been kind enough to praise it uh, quite, quite often. And we have had a, a, a group of reform-minded agencies in the UN, uh, UNDP, uh, the uh, Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, which takes a human rights-based approach, uh, UN AIDS, which knows that you cannot end the HIV epidemic as long as you have uh, the uh, use, people using injecting drugs with, with, without the harm reduction measures in place and so on. Uh, so they are helpful. Uh, WHO is kind of more or less helpful. Uh, the UN Office on Drugs and Crime is distinctly unhelpful. Uh, so you have a range of views in the UN system which tend to be played out as well. And of course, you could try to get a common position, but it mightn't, mightn't be the position that one wants. So uh, maybe it's best to let uh, many voices uh, speak, as it were, or a thousand flowers bloom, as Mao Zedong once, once said. Uh, but 
the special session in 2016, for the first time, really brought better concepts around health and harm reduction and rights into the conversation. Uh, next, and, and Peter Dunn came on behalf of New Zealand with a delegation and made what is thought to be you know, really one of the most helpful speeches in, in this, uh, this respect. And remember our national drug policy from the previous government produced under Peter's uh, leadership uh, actually was strong on health pillars, so we do have something to, uh, to build on uh, there. Uh, so next year in March there will be a meeting of the Commission on Narcotic Drugs in Vienna, uh, and it will be attended at ministerial level, and I very much hope that New Zealand will be there as one of a set of more reform-minded countries that accepts that the current approaches don't work and uh, we need to try something new. It may be, actually, that this uh, high-level meeting uh, has no outcome at all, or one that says very little because there is just such a huge uh, range of opinion now uh, among the, uh, the UN member, member states. Uh, so coming back to the New Zealand context uh, as I conclude uh, these remarks, uh, firstly, I think it's a time of opportunity, but also a time when things could go in the wrong direction. On the opportunity side, there will be a referendum on cannabis. Uh, it, it's not obviously completely determined how and when. New Zealand Drug Foundation uh, position, and the Drug Foundation has very much supported our visit uh, uh, here this week and all the arrangements. Their position is that legislation should be passed uh, on uh, the legalisation and regulation of cannabis, and that should be put to a referendum for a yes-no vote, so people are very clear what they're voting about. With referenda, you have to have an absolutely clear question, otherwise it's, it's a muddle. Uh, and I support that, that approach. Ideally, I think the next year would be spent uh, you know, with public consultations and drawing up the legislation and passing it, and then you've got a year to the general election uh, to have a, a debate about it. So there's that. There's also the therapeutic cannabis uh, legislation, which went before Parliament. Now, uh, this is a, uh, well, a, a little bit problematic now because you have... Uh, Labor, National, the Greens, all saying they support therapeutic cannabis, but each has their own version. So you really need, I think, the leaders to come together, mandate officials to work together and get the best regime they can. Otherwise, this will go around in circles. And uh, you know, we can all cite the cases, and one was given to us at the civil society meeting we had yesterday of someone who said, look, I, I buy it. I spend $1,000 a month. I don't really have $1,000 a month, but that's what I'm spending. You know, it should be able to be accessed uh, more, more uh, than, than it can be at the, at the present time. So that needs to be sorted out. And then uh, we have uh, these very tragic uh, cases, the 40 to 45 deaths of people from the so-called uh, synthetic cannabis. Now, I'm of the view that you never waste a crisis. This crisis should be the opportunity uh, for uh, innovation, experimentation uh, by us uh, learning from the Swiss, the Canadians, what happens in Sydney, Portugal, wherever, on how to have a very significant harm reduction uh, approach in, in, in this area. And I do find, as I look around, that New Zealand is really very far behind uh, many places now. Uh, we don't have the safe consumption spaces. Yes, we, we have methadone maintenance from, from years ago, but we're not really addressing the, the new issues that have arisen in the drug field in a significant harm reduction way. Uh, we need more, ac uh, more, more access to services like that in every respect. We had the sobering experience a couple of days ago of going to Arahata Women's Prison in Tawa, Wellington, and uh, sat with the staff and with the, uh, the prisoners who were in the drug treatment program, uh, the comment was made by a number of those women that they had never been able to access a service before they became prisoners. Well, that's wrong. We need services in our communities where people are when, when they need them and they're prepared to use them. So I, I think there's so much that could be done now, uh, and I know we have you know, good public health leadership now, in our health department with the new uh, Director General to really seize this and say, let's give it everything we've got, drawing on the best advice and experience from around the world uh, to tackle this particular crisis and 
and, and, and innovate uh, in this, this area. Because it does seem a little tragic that we haven't had significant innovation in this space since the response to the HIV epidemic with the needle exchange scheme of 31 years ago, uh, which is rather, rather a long time. Uh, so I think there's much of interest in this report uh, for, for New Zealand. And as I say, the recommendations in essence are that we, we, we should move to, uh, away from a prohibition regime to a regulatory one, uh, seek the best evidence we can, uh, and get on with it. And in the case of the so-called synthetic uh, cannabis uh, uh, drug uh, uh, crisis, and it, it, is, it is a crisis, a public health crisis, uh, we need to move fairly fast, or we'll be here in a year's time saying another 45 marginalised people died of that. Thank you. So thank you very much for these uh, very in enlightened and, and visionary remarks. I'll add a couple of things before we get to a, a, a Q&A session of about 15 minutes, I believe. A couple of points from the Canadian experience. There's a very famous slide in evidence-based uh, drug policy debates that's shown very often, which is sort of the curve that goes on the left side is prohibition, on the far right is liberalization, and then you sort of have the bottom of the harm curve with regulation and medicalization in the middle, which is sort of the ideal type of public health-oriented policy. I think it also, at the same time, points to a couple of pitfalls or important issues that need to be carefully uh, considered in the regulation debate, which is what actually influences or what are the determinants of successful and effective regulation versus some of the, the tricky challenges. I'll give you one sort of blatant example. If you think about the opioid crisis in North America, which by the way, by now has killed about a quarter million to 300,000 people in the last decade alone. I think a colleague of mine illustrated this reason. This is sort of the equivalent of a jumbo jet crashing uh, every 10 days or so and killing all the passengers. Just to imagine a little bit sort of the extent of this, of this crisis. Um, the origins of this crisis are actually within the system that we believe is the safest place to regulate and protect ourselves from the harms of psychopharmaceuticals, which is the medical system. So medicalization and medical regulation does not necessarily equate or translate into safety or public health or what have you as desirable outcomes. There are a number of factors that can actually countervail or undermine them. And I think a lot of that in North America and the North American health systems has to do with commercialization of healthcare and commercial aspects of prescribing drugs and quick fixes by drugs for chronic illnesses or diseases that deserve other considerations, et cetera, et cetera. So the point being, do not assume that regulation or medicalization immediately brings safety and public health as a given. The other point of concern for me relates to cannabis legalization under a public health umbrella as implemented in Canada. I think we've regulated the use side and the retail availability and accessibility of cannabis very strictly in the Canadian model. At the same time, on the supply side, just take note of the following facts. We now have 125 licensed commercial marijuana producers who are supplying the, um, the large-scale production and the supply for a retail market that is estimated to be in the neighborhood of six, from six to nine billion dollars a year. It's a massive industry that in terms of size and lucrative aspects in a free market environment is very similar to the alcohol and the tobacco industry. And I'm not fully convinced at this point that the government regulations, there has been some safeguards around advertising and production, et cetera, but those safeguard, whether those safeguards are enough to truly prevent a new alcohol or tobacco industry or some of the collateral damages that we've seen from the su supply and then commercialized production side. So that's an issue that needs to be thought through very carefully um, as well to truly protect 
the health of our populations and, and our communities and drug users under schemes of regulations. But these are just a couple of com additional comments from me. I think we're going now to a quick Q&A uh, from the audience and uh, using a bit of interactive time to, to further this important debate and discussion. I think there are rotating mics in the room. So uh, by signals, if we just start the Q&A, I think the first hand was right over there. That gentleman, please. Well, uh, it's nearly good afternoon. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor and Madame. Um, I really enjoyed your talk. My, a, little, a little, very short story. I'm a clinical pharmacologist, a medical doctor. I came from California 35 years ago. In the first, like, <laughs> like Professor Richter, in my first days here, I was invited to a debate on med legalization of, of marijuana in the town hall in Auckland. And the dean of the medical school at the time Professor David uh, Cole advised me, well, you can say what you want, Nick, but don't ever admit that you've smoked it. <laughs> so 35 years on, would it help the case? <laughs> stand, stand up. <laughs> it's a bit like coming out of the closet. So that's my question. Thank you. I'm pointing to Sally Caswell, who knows a lot about alcohol regulation. So, Sally, the, the mic is coming to you. Yeah. Thank you very much. I was, um, I was very pleased to hear your references to the dangers involved with commercialization and I'm um, very pleased to hear Benedict's uh, comments at the end there. Um, I think we have to acknowledge that it's, it, it's too late to avoid big cannabis. Big cannabis is here. Um, if you look at the relationship that's building between the big alcohol and big cannabis with Heineken producing cannabis-infused mineral water and uh, cannabis-infused beer is coming and so on, um, we, we're too late. Now, I heard Ms. Dreyfus this morning on the radio say that you felt that it was a great shame that marketing of alcohol was not controlled more carefully. And can I just say why that is the case, both here and in your country? It's there because big alcohol is so strong that it is not possible for the, the health sector within the countries to actually make changes. And we are living in a world where the trade treaties, the economic agreements are now really privileging um, the way in which big transnational corporations are able to influence government policy. We've succeeded with tobacco because of the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control, as Helen will, will, will back me up on this. We need a Framework Convention on Alcohol Control, but we also need to be thinking about a really sensible response at the international level to what's happening with cannabis. So I really ask the Global Commission to be thinking about that very seriously. Uh, it, to make it a question, would you comment? <laughs> any, any comments in response? Well, if you, if you read our, our report, you will see how cautious we are when we speak about regulation. We, we really recommend to begin with a stronger regulation, and if it is too strong, it is easy to bring a little bit more opening. But don't, don't just liberalize because this is exactly the way uh, that uh, alcohol and tobacco had a very free world, a jungle where they could do what they wanted to do. And for alcohol and tobacco, we are coming back from a too liberalized uh, world to more regulation. And this is uh, absolutely uh, necessary but difficult because, as you say, the lobbies are pow powerful. The, I mean, I, I know I had to fight, uh, for instance, against advertising in TV in my country for, for alcohol, but uh, everybody told, or the lobby told us that, well, Switzerland, but uh, if the people have no advertising in the Swiss TV, they will receive advertising in the French TV, TV or the German TV they are watching uh, in the same way. So, I mean, 
the international power of the of the big alcohol and big tobacco is really a threat and we cannot make the same errors when we when we speak here about learning from the errors it is also learning from the regulated market that are existing now medicine alcohol and tobacco questions. We have one in the far up, the gentleman in the blue shirt. Sorry, I know about three people by name in this country so far. <laughs> I want to congratulate one of the last cantons in Switzerland for finally giving a woman the vote this year. I do that as a paradox because one of the ironies is, is around the, uh, the profound effect, of course, on minority groups in Switzerland, particularly Romani, uh, who, who are profoundly affected by opioid use, which is very prevalent when you arrive in Geneva and other places, so the, the paradox around that, which is the paradox of New Zealand and Aotearoa as well. And if we start to look at the number of people who are profoundly affected, then it's reflected in the, in the May a presentation given by Tuari Portiki and, of course, by Peter Dunn in the magnificent uh, uh, piece that you, that, you, um, that you chaired. And I, ironically, four weeks later, the Russians flexed their muscle in the World Health Assembly 69 in Geneva by practising the power of veto to say to nations who were that creative, well, we're still in charge. Which brings me to my question, how, which is a local one, really. So. I absolutely support this magnificent document and all the, the narrative around it. But it draws the question, how do you arrest the punitive nature of New Zealand laws and policies? Because at the end of the day, uh, this is a conversation that we in this room and many others who've been profoundly affected as family members or otherwise, or users, or people who have used like that gentleman over there. Um, you know, uh, uh, we need to arrest the fundamental issues within our own nation, which is part of that paradox around the policies and the laws that actually send those people still to jail. That's, the question is around that, I know. Oh, and, um, and, and can you fix world peace on a Wednesday? Thanks. <laughs> um, I mean, in essence, we're saying decriminalisation and regulation because people are being unnecessarily criminalised. You know, if drug use is a crime, it's, it's, it's a victimless crime. And so why, why do we put users away? You know, we see the figures that say that, you know, the rate of uh, cannabis arrests or convictions is, is down 70% uh, since 1990, but that still leaves 30%. It still leaves a lot of police discretion to throw the book at people. Now, my last three years in office, I had a, a good go at trying to get the prison numbers down after they'd been rising for some time. And uh, we had a good look at who gets arrested, et cetera, in New Zealand. And what the figures showed, and I'm sure they're the same now, is that at every stage of the process, Maori were three to four times as numerous as, uh, three to four times as likely to be arrested prosecuted, convicted, and given a custodial sentence. We have some real issues, I think, in our justice uh, system. So the way the, the laws on drugs have, have worked, of course, have had a particularly adverse impact on, on Māori as well. And, and that, if, if nothing else, should drive us to say, you know, we, we've got some fundamental issues to, to address here. I mean, I have been concerned at the, the, the punitive nature of penal policy. Uh, we do need... Uh, to go back to sensible sentencing guidelines, sensitisation of judges as to the wide range of options they have. Uh, we uh, you know, need bail law that is not as repressive as it is. There's a whole lot of things, things you could do. Uh, and I think that we have yet to see the full disastrous potential of the three strikes and your outlaw that was passed in recent years because people are building up to the three strikes. And once that's triggered, you would see the prison population blow out again. Uh, so, you know, time really, not just for a fundamental rethink on drug law settings, but actually on our justice and penal policy in general. Peter, 
Hello. Um, I'm, I'm, oh, can you hear me? Yes. Um, b building on what both Benedict and Sally said, um, c concerned about our trust in regulation as a space to go in because it relies on our governments to work um, independently and impartially with, um, with, with the development of re regulation. But our experience with other addictive consumptions, alcohol, tobacco and gambling, have been that um, when, because of the high profits associated with these consumptions, um, industries will, will focus on relationships with policymakers and develop um, strong pathways in, into those spaces. We, we see that particularly with alcohol and gambling in, in New Zealand. And we don't understand that that very well. We need to understand that better if we're going to avoid the kind of weak regulatory or failure, failures at regulation, such as with gambling, um, ha happening in our, in our country. And, and so I, I just wonder, um, a lot of this re relies on the, uh, us trusting the, um, the independence and impartiality and responsiveness to, to public health perspectives in, in our government and, and with alcohol, tobacco and gambling, I don't think we can be that confident. Well, look, any initiatives we take to regulate have to be better than the unregulated criminal market we have at the moment. That's, that's my starting point. And we can learn a lot from uh, you know, what's happened in the other areas. Actually, I think in tobacco, we're doing pretty well. And uh, the tobacco industry doesn't get too much of a voice here. Although it's always looking for a way back in, right? It's uh, like now complaining that the taxes are driving a criminal market and, and, and so on and so forth. So you've always, always got to be vigilant. Uh, alcohol has got away with far too much and, and, and gambling uh, likewise. So as we move to regulate in this area, as I hope we will, uh, let's be aware of what all the, all the pitfalls are. And, and before there is any kind of uh, legal supply industry, as in cannabis, uh, you know, sort of slap on it before it, it, it even gets started and learn from, you know, the, the obvious example and precedence there's going to be from Canada as to whether they've been too lax or you know, how they might correct that. But Ruth, would you like to comment on, you know, the, the sort of, do, do we not regulate because we mightn't get it right, or do we regulate because we know it's the way to go and we have to keep improving it? Well, one of the consequences of the prohibition is that there is very uh, little knowledge about uh, the reality of drug in society. Uh, and there is also very little knowledge about the substances themselves. When you think that uh, cannabis is now studied to at the WHO uh, Specialized Expert Committee for the first time since the 30s, 1930s was the last time that there was more or less a tentative to know what cannabis is really. And now we are thinking, uh, we are looking around to know what it, it is, uh, knowing that there are uh, uh, around 100 uh, active substances in, in, in the plant. And we don't know what they are. And the same is also for the sociological and the economical aspect of the drug markets. We don't know a lot about that. So regulation has, is really the opportunity and there is a necessity of a scientific approach. We have to collect the evidence and to know what are the consequences of the measure we are taking. As we were, and uh, uh, Professor Fisher was one of the members of the team who tried uh, during five years to study the criminological, the, pharma uh, the clinical uh, result, the sociological result, and so on, of the uh, heroin prescription in, in Switzerland. So we have to regulate, we have to be very cautious, we have to know that the rules will not be the same for the different substances, because they have different not only different pharma uh, pharmacological um, uh, characteristics, but other kind of markets, other kind of consumption. And I think regulation is also the real opportunity to know at the end what we are really, what is the reality of drug in our society. 
as long as it is a black box, as long as it is just in criminal hands, you will never have this transparency that is needed to know how to deal with. So I think we have time for one, two quick focused questions. I'll just go <laughs> to this side here, the gentleman in the white shirt, maybe. Thank you. Um, very briefly, question two parts. Do you remember what year you legalized medicinal cannabis in New Zealand, Helen? No, because we didn't. 2006, industrial hemp, which is medicinal cannabis. The Ministry of Health has proposed to prohibit the use of industrial hemp for therapeutic purposes because fundamentally this conversation, this narrative, is dominated by forces that most of us do not consider. It's a $1.1 trillion industry, the pharmaceutical industry. It's largely controlled by our friends north of the border. Education is a major problem. We had a past president of the International Cannabinoid Research Society as academic director of pharmacology in this institution, and the endogenous cannabinoid system, which regulates human health and protects us from injury, was covered in two lectures briefly as a promising pathway for pharmacological interventions in the future. So how do we confront the failure of institutions, politicians, regulators, and our public servants to actually look at the facts, look at the evidence, and do the best for the people of New Zealand? Rhetorical or actual question? Look, we, we should endeavour to have evidence-based policy. That's where we need to go. Now, as Ruth says, there's a lot we don't know. So there's going to need to be some innovation and some experimentation with how we tackle uh, these, these issues. But others are tackling them. Others have precedence. You know, we can be informed by you know, what else is happening out there that seems to be coming from a, a, a similar per perspective. No one's saying there's you know, the magic answer here you know, or, or any one way or template. But what we know is what is happening isn't working. So we have to do better than that. I just add something. I mean, I, I'm really aware about the awareness that uh, economic power can jeopardize uh, the will to have a smart uh, regulation, a responsible uh, regulation, and that the power of pharmaceutical industry, of uh, lobbies like tobacco and alcohol are a threat. But what is the alternative? Is the alternative, I mean, at least this lobby are known. They are obliged to fight more or less openly against regulation that are not in their interest. But what, what is the alternative? Criminal organization that are corrupting the state, that are trying to take really the power without that we know exactly who is at the driver. I mean, the, if this is the alternative, I prefer a fight, and we have to fight against lobby, than a fight against a criminal organization that are putting the rules. I come from a very gender equality aware society. This has been very male dominated questioning. Are there women who would like to ask this question? Good morning, kia ora kato everyone. Um, my name is Joanne, I'm currently studying trauma, uh, looking at domestic violence in families, uh, where I know that people who have experienced trauma will self-medicate with cannabis and other drugs. <coughs> I've seen it encouraged in families uh, with children uh, at the ages of 11 and 13, being sold through schools, and it's very hard uh, to talk about. Uh, it's very sad to see this happening in our country uh, in schools. <clears throat> through regulation, I'd like to understand how this would be stopped uh, being traded in schools by our teenagers. Um, 
uh, well, look, of course it shouldn't be sold in schools, and under any form of regulation there's no way that that would ever be sanctioned. But I think, you know, the issues you're raising also have a, you know, a number of other uh, aspects to them, which is uh, marginalised families, uh, a lot of issues in their lives, uh, children, you know, exposed to things they shouldn't be exposed to. You know, th there's, you know, really, I think, in, in this, a call for, you know, much more attention to the support we give young families to follow a, you know, a, a good path and not, uh, not, not the path that, you know, leads to another a generation experiencing violence and and abuse. So, you know, of course, you know, a lot, a lot of these issues are intersecting, and I think you know, you know there's been for some time a significant underinvestment uh, in New Zealand in our children and our families, and you know, trying to you know create the basics of a good life for everyone. So, quick last. Question work, 20 seconds less, 20 seconds or less. I actually just want to add on to that. So my name is Arslan. I'm here from the New Zealand AIDS Foundation today. Um, just talking about schools and talking about children, talking about the most vulnerable populations, I think um, this is where drug education can come into play, Jimmy. Education is a huge social determinant of health. Um, we already know this. Um, so let's, talk, let's work with sexual health services. Let's work with other organizations which already have support programs in schools like the PSA sexuality support programs, let's incorporate drug education, let's pass this through policy where we are able to expose our children in the sense of harm reduction. Yes, we're using it in the sense, but we're using it from a very early age nowadays. So it's about how can we minimize this harm until this regulation can happen. But yeah, that's what I wanted to just jump onto that with. But my question was around methamphetamine. We've talked a lot about drug regulation, the sense of cannabis and alcohol. But I find that as a member of the LGBT community, methamphetamine is hugely becoming widely available. It's becoming cheaper. And for a gay and bisexual man who grows up in a world which is bound by heteronormative values, goals, and belief system, we're already othered in that sense. Therefore, our, therefore our chances or our predisposition to engage in behaviors like escaping or risky sexual behaviors uh, exacerbated by drug use becomes even more. So what can, where is this dialogue around methamphetamine use nowadays? Where is this happening? It's not, and I want more of a light to be shed on this in that way. Thank you. Well, I, I think at this stage, we know quite little about MET and the weight and the market of MET and the effect of MET and the different kind of uh, substances that are on the, on the market. So we have to learn. And we have also to, and, and it's an invitation also for the medical uh, school and, uh, and the clinic to find, for instance, what kind of substitution could be acceptable for people who are addict on, on MET. To, to look what, uh, if there is an antidote, like naloxone is for the opiates for, methadone, uh, for, for, me, uh, for MET, methamphetamine. And I mean, we have to learn that, but uh, the principle of harm reduction are the same. And I think in the first, the first priority is probably uh, to find a way to enter into contact, to build confidence with methamphetamine consumers who are at the bottom of the society, the people who, who are really the victims of, of this epidemic now, as it is also the case, I would say, with the opiate epidemic in Canada and in the United States, where we see that the huge a population, poor white people on the countryside, and so we're never in contact, neither with harm reduction nor treatment. And they were entering into a dependence uh, mechanism that is killing, as uh, Professor Fisher said, uh, 10,000 of, uh, of people per year. So I mean, yes, we have to learn a lot, and when I said, I think, t several times that we have to adapt the policy to the different substances, that there is not one silver bullet that will uh, solve all the problem. It is exactly what you are uh, raising as a question. 
And about the youth, I think it's very important to have more information, more prevention. But uh, speaking to young people needs to be very clear, a very well-informed message. Because it, if it is not a well-informed message, it, if it is just, just say no, <laughs> the people will laugh. I mean, I know many, I know many adolescents who know more, uh, much more about cannabis than the teacher. And if the teacher is making a general discourse on cannabis, the pupils are laughing because they say, well, you don't understand what about what you are speaking. So information of the use is very important. Decriminalization is also important for the use for two reasons, because they can easier call for help if they have a problem or if they see a fellow having problem, what they will not do if they are the use against the adults, you see? This is the bad uh, parting point, uh, starting point for a good, uh, a good prevention. And I think what is very, very important for the youth is for the first consumers that they are informed immediately about the harm. And this is the question, for instance, for festival, for the consumption in large groups under the pressure of the peers to begin to consume without with knowing what is really the harms there. So dress, uh, uh, drug checking, for instance, in festival, where you can also enter into contact with young people who will consume perhaps for the first time, is also a harm measure, measure that is very, very useful and can save life, life of 16, 15, 16, 17 years, uh, uh, young people who are just for fun somewhere and could enter into a consumption that could be uh, killing them. Mm. So I, I, I used to say when I was Minister of Health that the very worst public health advice you could give from adults is to say to young people, don't do it. <laughs> because it's in the nature of youth to do things you're told not to do. So we've got to be a lot smarter than that. And what Ruth says is, is the reality. Young people are going to go to festivals and they're going to experiment. Wouldn't it be best if they could go into the tent with whatever they bought and have it tested or get some advice? As you know, there are efforts to do with Know Your Stuff, I think is the organisation, and the Drug Foundation supports it. Um, so, but you know, not all festival organisers accept this service because they're worried that they might be prosecuted for being accessories to a crime or some such thing. So we, we need to get real with our harm reduction. You know, work with people where they're at. It may not be where we think they should be at. You know, but that's not the point. That is where they're at, and we have to deal with the reality. So evidence based. Evidence-based drug education, probably a whole other topic for another symposium, another day. In the interest of time, I think we have to hand it over for some quick words to the New Zealand Drug Foundation, who I want to thank sincerely for coordinating this event with the University of Auckland. Uh, I want to give my personal sincere thanks to the commissioners for their time and, and insights. Uh, many more discussions and follow-up to come. Thank you very much for being here today. And I'll invite the New Zealand Drug Foundation up for some quick marks before Dean John Fraser will close the event. Thank you very much for your time. Tēnā koutou katoa, ngā mahi nui ki a koutou katoa, kāranga mai, mahi mai. Uh, ko au, ko kāpua katoa maha ka te maunga, ko ofio te awa, no oti poti ahau, ko te whanganui a tāra te kainga, uh, nō reira tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Uh, my name is Carly Mercia, I work at the Drug Foundation in uh, Wellington. For those of us who don't know you, we're a, a charitable trust, um, independent of the government, um, we have many roles, but one of our key roles is to advise the government on safe, effective and evidence-based approaches to drug policy. Um, and as policy manager, that's my sort of day in, day out job, um, eat, sleep, breathe drug policy. Um, it's a dream job, <laughs> it really is. Um, so 
as you can imagine, it's been a great privilege um, for us to have the Global Commission on Drug Policy here this week. Uh, we've been escorting them um, to some meetings with uh, MPs uh, in Wellington. And I think because of the great manner that they carry as Wahine Toa, um, we've been able to really see the conversation pushed ahead in Wellington with a full range of sort of political stripes, we've been able to get um, traction and, and moving some of these conversations forward. So we're incredibly grateful to that. So thank you for that. Um, I mean, wasn't that a great talk? It's just so refreshing to hear people saying things so frankly and clearly that um, I think even 10 years ago, we wouldn't have been able to, to we would have had a very different reception and 20 years ago, definitely. Um, so, I don't know if it's because I live in a bubble in Wellington, a drug policy bubble. Um, but it does feel like we're on the cusp of something. It does feel like we're in the beginning of a sea change sort of internationally with cannabis legalisation um, and various harm reduction measures that are sort of being introduced over the last 10 to 15 years around the world and in New Zealand. It feels like we're getting somewhere. I really hope that's the case. Um, and so it's been especially excellent timing, I think, for the visit coming to New Zealand at this time. We've got a number of issues on the boil, obviously. We've got the medical cannabis stuff going on far too slowly, in my opinion. Um, we've got the referendum on cannabis, hopefully by 2020, on uh, recreational use. Um, we've got a government in power that's actually, um, and not just the government, but also the opposition, that's really open to uh, following a health-based approach to the use of drugs, which is excellent news. Um, and then, of course, at the moment, we've also got this, this tragic case of um, 45 synthetic cannabinoid deaths over the last year. It's a new uh, crisis for New Zealand to deal with, and um, it's been really great to hear the, um, the commissioners talking this week to MPs about some of the harm reduction measures that we can put in place to, to counter that crisis. Um, so the, the Global Commission on Drug Policies um, report and their... Um, their attitude to drug policy is very similar to that of the Drug Foundation. So we uh, launched a, a report last year on um, a model drug uh, policy, which you may have um, received a handout about when you came in. Um, and we've got three planks to that, first being decriminalisation of possession and use of all drugs, uh, second being legalisation of cannabis with a strict public health focus, and third being much better um, investment in harm reduction and treatment. Uh, in New Zealand, uh, we'd like to see at least a doubling of that of the budget put towards that. It's woefully underfunded at the moment. Um, so we hope you will join us um, in working towards these goals. Um, we hope that if you haven't given us your email already, please do. Um, we'll be keeping in touch about various activities that we have planned in promoting these um, these three goals over the next few years, especially in the lead up to the cannabis referendum. Um, so please be part of that journey with us. Um, so I just wanted to end by saying a huge thank you to all of you for being here today. It's great to see so many people here. Um, it's been really interesting conversations as well, so that's great. Um, and I also want to thank the university and especially the Faculty of um, Medical and Health Sciences for being such wonderful hosts and organising this event today, so thank you for that. Um, also to the Hugh Green Foundation for their... Um, Wonderful generosity in creating the new role that um, Benedict Fisher has uh, just stepped into. Uh, we're really grateful to have this new uh, expertise in New Zealand, so thank you very much for that. And of course, thank you to Benedict himself. Uh, we're really looking forward to working with you in New Zealand, and a great big welcome from all of us. Um, and I'll hand over to Dean Fraser. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carly. You've just said everything I was going to say. <laughs> uh, this has been a tremendously uplifting symposium. Um, I have learnt a great deal, um, as I hope you all have. Uh, I think having two very powerful, influential people in the room to share their vision of what I believe is around the corner, and that is change, uh, is being, um, makes this, I think, a very, very special event. Clearly. We are talking to the converted in this room, but I hope that the message goes out from these symposiums that uh, change is necessary and that we are all in, it, in this together. Um, my take home message from the symposium is just say no doesn't work, but we need to be cautious about saying just yes. Um, there's obviously a uh, continuum that we need to be cautious of as we proceed carefully. 
So thank you all for coming. Uh, thank you especially to the New Zealand Drug Foundation um, for involving us. It's been a pleasure to host this. It really has. And I hope we can continue to work with you um, to present what I think is a very important message to uh, this country. Thank you to Ruth and Helen. Uh, it's been wonderful to have you, and uh, you're always welcome back at any time. Uh, Benedict, your work has started. So. <laughs> And thank you, Carly, for a wonderful uh, summation. Um, so, ma te atua kutu e manaki, hari tu atu hoki tu mai, noho ora mai ra. May God bless and protect you. Go well, turn in good health. Farewell. I leave you in good health. Thank you.